continue talking about the nature of nature and how I am not, I'm not your classical, uh, you know, classic nature guy. Like, I don't own a whole lot of flannel, um, like some of you nature people do. I don't go on hikes, like, uh, a lot, like some of you do. I, I do spend some time outside, but it's normally to sit on the patio or, or to mow the grass, which is a necessary evil at this time of year. Some of you are nodding your head because you live there too. But something about nature, I think, that, that illustrates an important truth, especially the truth that we're going to talk about this morning, is um, the animal kingdom and how God created uh, animals in such a way where they teach us a lot, not just about who he is and what he does, but a lot about ourselves. And uh, the National Geographic website, uh, the kids' version, um, has on there this information about the um, blowfish or otherwise known as um, the puffer fish, which actually inflates itself into a ball shape to evade predators. Uh, and the interesting thing about a blowfish is that they actually are able to fill their elastic stomachs um, a little differently than we fill our elastic stomachs, right? Um, they fill them with water and, and sometimes air, and then they use them to kind of scare away predators because what they do is they make themselves seem bigger and badder than they are. But it's not just that they seem bigger and badder than they are. There's something inside of them that proves to be deadly to, uh, to those uh, uh, beings or those uh, creatures that exist around them. They're actually filled with a foul-tasting uh, and potentially deadly uh, chemical, and it's actually deadly to humans as 12 hundred times more deadly than cyanide. In fact, there's enough poison in one puffer fish or blowfish to kill 30 adult humans. Now, what does that have to do with the issue of pride? Here it is. We as humans have this, this ability to uh, blow ourselves up with pride, to puff ourselves up with arrogance, to make ourselves seem bigger and badder perhaps than we are. And inside of every one of us is this toxic poison that can prove to be problematic in every marriage, in every family, in every friendship, in every neighborhood, in every church, if left to ourselves. We all have been well acquainted with the danger of pride. We're better at spotting it in other people than we are in ourselves. But the fact of the matter is, not a one of us likes pride in other people, Right? Um, nobody likes a me monster. No woman ever went on a, on a first date with a guy and said, I just loved how that guy talked about himself the whole time, right? It, it doesn't happen. Um, no parent ever gets on Facebook and starts bragging about how selfish their kids are, right? Uh, no wife ever says, I love how my husband is able to point out every fault and flaw of mine. No friend ever says, I love how, how my friend superficially covers up all of her flaws to make herself appear like she's someone she's not. We can't stand pride in other people. No coworker ever says, I love how this coworker of mine always talks about himself and his accomplishments and how he's the hero of every one of the stories that he tells. No church member ever walks away and says, I love how the people at my church look down on me and judge my every move. Not a one of us likes pride in other people, but we have an awfully hard time seeing the pride that exists in ourselves. And that's the danger of pride, is that it can't see itself in a mirror. And what is pride? It's that, that exaggerated, uh, often arrogant, unreasonably high view or opinion of ourselves and an unreasonably low view of, of the people around us. It's a self-centered kind of a disease and an ultimately self-destructive kind of disease, but not just self-centered and not just self-destructive. It's actually destructive, like uh, the poison inside of a blowfish. It's dangerous to the people that God has placed around us. And if you recall, it was pride that, that was at the center of Satan's fall. It was pride that led to the first sin in the Garden of Eden. And, and men and women and boys and girls have been dealing with pride ever since. And pride's dangerous. And every one of us has a story. In fact, every one of us probably has a litany of, of, of stories of people who've been prideful in our lives, people who did this or did that, or... or um, negative impact, the negative impact that pride has had on relationships that we've had with, with other people. And yet again, we have a hard time seeing the pride that exists inside of us. Pride is so dangerous. And so the question is, how do we learn to put away pride? And how do we learn then to pursue humility? How do we learn then as we pursue humility to have relationships that are, are whole?
or relationships that are healthy. And the good news is that God knew that we would struggle with pride because in the book of Proverbs and throughout God's word is a whole lot of wisdom to actually help us to live lives that are characterized more and more by that humility that comes from Jesus and less and less like the pride that marks every single human being on the face of, 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 of the earth. And, and the, the good news for us is that as we read these Old Testament Proverbs through those New Testament lenses, as we read these, these truths through the lenses of the gospel and through the good news of Jesus, we learn that Jesus is the one who shows us how it's done, but Jesus is also the source for getting it right. And the more we pursue Jesus, the more humble we will become. The more we pursue Jesus, the less prideful we will become become. And so how do we do that? What does it look like? That's the journey we're going on this morning. We're going to look at three different Proverbs. We're going to focus on four different observations and applications we can make from these Proverbs. And what we're also going to do is we're going to talk about a New Testament passage that I think brings all of this to life and that points us to the good news of the gospel because that, my friends, is where our hope for getting this right is. Our hope is found completely and totally in Jesus. Now, uh, the, the proverb, the first one that we're going to talk about, 1618, is one that I feel like everyone has heard of at least once in their life, whether they are well-versed in the Bible or they're not at all uh, versed in the Bible. It's uh, Proverbs 1618, right? Pride goes before destruction or pride cometh uh, before the fall. And uh, it was funny this morning before the eight o'clock service, I had someone come up to me and say, oh, what are you preaching on today? I said, pride. And then he quoted uh, Proverbs uh, 16, 18 verbatim from the King James Version. Um, but it's so true. We know it from our experience. We, we've heard it uh, shared throughout life that, that pride really does go before uh, destruction, that a haughty spirit uh, really does lead to our downfall. And, and the, the, the truth is this, that pride is in so many ways destructive. That pride doesn't just destroy our relationships, pride actually starts to destroy us from the inside. And I want to talk a little bit about how pride is destructive, not just in our relationships, but how it starts in us first. For, for example, I read recently that pride begins where healthy self-esteem ends. Self-esteem is a good thing, right? For followers of Jesus, uh, the, God is the one who, who informs us of, of, of who we are through our faith in Jesus. A healthy sense of that is a very good thing for followers of Jesus, that we remember that, 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 that God says we're holy and dearly loved by God through our faith in Jesus. We're chosen by God. We're made in God's image. We're forgiven by Jesus. We're a new creation because of Jesus. We're, we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. That the source of, of that healthy self-esteem, it, it begins and it ends with God. It's all tied up in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But again, pride begins where that healthy self-esteem ends. The truth is that, that we, we really have nothing, and nothing we even make for ourselves is really ours in the first place. Nothing we make for ourselves really comes from our own doing, that God is always the source, and it starts to destroy us when we think it's ours or we think it's about us. And we all have these stories that we could share about how... how um, People who were prideful actually experience the downfall that comes from pride. We love those stories, don't we? Uh, the stories where the, the prideful person is brought low again. Like how many of us, I used this in the 8 o'clock service this morning. We'll see how it lands in the, the uh, 930 service. So how many of you have seen Scooby-Doo? Okay, it's been around for a while, right? And we love the endings of Scooby-Doo, right? Because what happens at the end? The criminals, they get caught, right? Um, and, and then um, everyone has that, like, that weird, uncomfortable laugh at the end, right? You, you, right? You've seen, <laughs> you know, they, 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 it's how it always ends. We love the Scooby-Doo ending because it feels really good when prideful people are brought low. But how many of us feel really good when it's our pride that brings us low? We ask questions like, why me, Lord? Or, or what did I do to deserve this? And we forget that... Um, Life sort of happens and it knocks us off our high horse. We discover that we're not quite as high and mighty as we think we are. It's like the turtle who uh, decided that he wanted to go on a trip uh, like the um, birds do in the wintertime. He wanted to go to Florida, but he knew that he could not walk 
the full length of, of the, the trip from the north to uh, Florida where it's warm and happy and where Mickey Mouse lives. And so he enlisted the help of two geese to help him. And so he came up with this great idea that he was going to get a piece of rope and that one of the geese was going to carry the one end of the rope in one, uh, you know, on one side and the other was going to carry it on the other. And they were going to fly and he was just going to hold on to the rope by his hand or by his mouth. And so he... Um, he did that, and he clinched on that, that rope as, as tight as he could, and the geese flew, and they were going, it was going so well until someone noticed how good that idea was, and they said to the turtle, they shouted up, hey, that is an amazing idea. Who thought of that? And the turtle, not being able to resist a compliment to himself, said, I did. And you know what happened then to the turtle. No? No? Did, he had it in his... That, too, landed better at 8 o'clock. So, again... Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm going to work on new material between services uh, next week. Um, but you've experienced this, haven't you, in your own life and in the lives of others? Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Do you see the connection? Fall? Turn? No, okay. All right. So how problematic then is pride? That's, that's a question, right? How, how destructive is that, that pride? Well, it doesn't just affect us. It actually does affect those that we live in relationship with. And think about this, how, how that pride eventually comes out in, in, in self-absorption. Think about how that, that pride eventually comes out in arguments where, where, where one or both parties are convinced that they are right and the other is absolutely wrong. Think about how it becomes problematic in, in relationships where the other one is tr always trying to one-up the other. Think about how problematic it is in relationships when, when one is trying to make themselves look better than those around them. Think about how pride is at the source of all the contention we deal with, how pride is at the source of all the arguments that, that we enter into. Pride is at the source of a lot of the strife that we face. It's at the source of a lot of strained relationships. It's at the source of a lot of broken relationships because our relationships with people start to crumble when pride does its work. Our relationships with people start to crumble when pride tells us to keep ourselves first, when pride tells us that we're most important. Again, these words are so true. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. But notice how destructive it gets because Proverbs 11 verse 2 says, if you read it right from the word of God, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. And, and notice that pride and disgrace go hand in hand. We tend not to remember that when we're dealing with our own pride issues, but that word disgrace in the original language is actually uh, translated other places as shame or dishonor, that, that when we choose to live out pride and, and live in a prideful way, when we choose to, to sort of look down at others or on others or we dig our heels in the sand or we, we uh, talk a whole lot more than we're willing to listen, um, it actually brings a sense of, of shame and disgrace, and really the word here is dishonor. It brings dishonor, it breeds dishonor. Pride is actually the opposite of the grace that God is and the grace that God gives. Pride is, is actually the opposite of the honor that God deserves. I did a little word study on the word pride as it's used here in the Old Testament, and it actually speaks to a, a putting ourselves in a place of, 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 of God, putting ourselves in a place where, where, where only God is, that God is the one who's sovereign over all. And when we default to pride, we start to feel like we are sovereign over all. There's a very real sense that pride brings dishonor, which is why we need humility, and which is why this is so true. With humility comes wisdom. To be humble is to be wise. Humility gives us the wisdom we need to put away pride. But notice then how deep and dishonorable pride is. It affects our relationships. And, and so here's where we're going to park for a few minutes. And so I, I hope that you um, can focus with me on, on this particular proverb and then the New Testament passage that we're going to use to illustrate it. I think all of us realize that pride is destructive. I think all of us realize how dishonorable pride is, but we don't always realize how badly it affects us and those who have to deal with us. When there is strife, there is pride. And pride tells us that we're better than others. Pride tells us that what we want matters the most. Pride makes us control others. Pride makes us demand from others. There are times when pride angers. There are times when pride becomes uh, jealous. But pride always 
causes disagreements. And so grab your Bible, either the one you brought with you or the one that's read that's in front of you. And I want you to turn with me toward the back of your Bible uh, to the book of James. The book of James, it's in the New Testament. I want you to turn there, and I want you to do that so that you can see it with your own eyes. That these are not my words, these are God's words to us. So in your Bible, James chapter 4. So James comes a little bit before uh, the book of Revelation, so it's uh, toward the back. Um, and in this particular passage in the New Testament, James asks that question that, that, that maybe you've asked from time to time, a question that I've asked. Um, so what causes the fights and quarrels that I experience? What causes the fights and quarrels that, that you experience yourselves? In other words, he asks that age-old question, why can't we get along? What causes us to think badly about other people? What causes us to talk badly about other people? What causes friction in our marriage? What causes friction in the relationship we have with our kids or our parents? What causes the, 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 the strife that we have at times in our extended family relationships? What causes the disagreements that go on in our workplace? What causes the fights that go on at, that we experience at school? What causes the arguments that we deal with from time to time, even in our church environment? James answers that age-old question for us. He says, do they not come from your desires that battle within you? It's the answer that none of us likes to hear. The reason you and I have a hard time getting along with other people is because of the desires that exist in you and the desires that exist in me. Which is a pretty inconvenient truth, if you ask me. Because as much as we wish it were the case, the problem in our conflicts isn't our spouse. It's not our kids. It's not our parents. The problem in our conflicts isn't necessarily our extended family. The problem in our conflicts isn't necessarily our boss or our employees or our coworkers. The problem that we deal with at school isn't with our teachers or our professors. The problem that we deal with in our church is not necessarily with our pastor or with the members of the congregation. The reason why you and I have a hard time getting along with each other in various stages and phases of our relationships and in all the places where relationships exist is because of a pride issue that exists in you and a pride issue that exists in me. And notice how many times James, use, James uses that little word, you. And maybe like, like me, you read this and you want to say, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. What about, and then James says, you, 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 you. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? And he goes and describes how, how ugly it gets. You want something, but you don't get it. You desire what you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. This morning in the early service, uh, I quoted uh, John Yankel, who's a member of our congregation, and, and uh, so he was in the 8 o'clock service. And uh, sometimes he uses an illustration to describe how selfish we are at our core uh, as human beings, that babies are some of the like, most selfish creatures that exist on the planet, right? Um, and it's so good that God made babies small because if they were as big as us or bigger than us, they would kill us to get what they want, right? They make demands, they, they, they desire... Uh, but they, they do not have, and boy, if they were big enough, they would kill us. And then it brought to mind, too, I was uh, talking about that, that second part that's highlighted in yellow behind me, that you covet and you, you cannot get what you want, and so you quarrel and fight. And, and all week long, I, it's funny how often people started quoting the Rolling Stones to me after I quoted them last week in my sermon. And I couldn't understand why in the early service at 8 o'clock, the response when I, I, I shared the, the lyric, you can't always uh, have what you want, and everyone said want, and it was like overwhelmingly loud, and people were loud and proud in their response, and then in the second service, it was like, it was like a dull whisper. And 
and my sweet friend Raydell Marks came to me after the service last week, and uh, she said, now, Pastor Adam, you, you're forgetting that Mick Jagger is 75 years old, and there are fewer and fewer of us uh, who are in that age bracket. And so, uh, Raydell, uh, thumbs up for you. That was, that was fantastic. Um, <laughs> And, and Mick Jagger was right, but only because God was right in the first place. We, we can't always get what we want, and yet we want what we want. We covet uh, what we want. And so what do we do? We do what kids do. We quarrel, we fight, we dig our heels in the, in the sand, we, we, we throw temper tantrums. And, uh, and Adam Roberts quote, the only thing worse than a, a little kid's temper tantrum is an adult temper tantrum, right? And we've seen it in, in our lives. We see it in our families, we see it in our uh, relationships at work, where we go to school, we even at times see it among people uh, who are a fellow part of our faith family. But we do not have because we don't ask God. And here's the problem with pride. It causes us to take our eyes off of who or what ultimately matters and put our eyes where they don't belong. And when we default to pride, where do our eyes go? They go on ourselves. And so we make demands. We have these expectations. And when they're not met, it gets really ugly really quick. And not just for us, it actually affects the people around us. See, pride is a lot, and pardon the illustration, but you're going to understand it. It's soon becoming uh, swimming season, yes? Right? Um, so one of the things that I... Little story here. Um, one of the things that, that frustrates me sometimes when we go to the pool is that no sooner are we at the pool that our, our kids need to go to the bathroom, like, right away. Like, and so we try to teach them that it's a bad idea. Some of you are not. You've, you've either had kids or you were a kid. You know, like, we're, we're trying to teach them not to <coughs> pee in the pool, right? Because that pee problem isn't just your problem then. It's everyone else's problem. And when we default to pride, it's like peeing in the pool. <laughs> you laugh, but you've experienced it. You're, when you pee in the pool of your relationships with your pride, it affects everyone else who's swimming in that pool with you. And the same is true for my pride in the pool that we swim in together. You're not going to forget it now. You're gonna, <laughs> you'll think twice when you go swimming, but you're going to think twice when you default to pride in your relationships. I think James is right. The problem is our desires. It's our pride issues. Paul Tripp, one of my favorite authors, says this, either my heart is ruled by some desire for something that's in creation, or my heart is ruled by a desire for the creator and his will. When Jesus is at the center of our desires, our pride starts to diminish. When we're at the center of our desires, that pride starts to increase. And what is, what is the, 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 the rule for getting it right? It's exactly what we talked about last week. It's to, to make sure that our focus is only on Jesus. And I, I had you do that little exercise with your hand, right? And to make the circle really small until you can only see the cross. And if only you and I lived a little more like that, when it came to the, the things that, that, that are going on inside of us, to, when it came to those desires, if we, we said, does it really matter to Jesus? But we persist in not getting what we want so we get angry. And this is what makes marriage so challenging and what, parenting, what makes parenting so challenging and uh, work, school, and even church so challenging at times. It's not the way we like it and so we get ticked off. But that little word, passions or desires, is the same word from which we get our word hedonism. And what's hedonism? It's a self-absorbed, sinful, self-indulgent sort of lifestyle. It's rooted in pride. It leads us to think higher of ourselves than we should. It causes us to be ego-driven instead of um, spirit-driven. Self-centered instead of Jesus-focused. Pride is at the root of virtually every sin since the Garden of Eden. And it's at the root of so much of our unhealthy conflict. Can you think of one argument you've ever experienced that wasn't in some way, at its core, motivated by pride? either yours or someone else's. So how do we deal with the pride going on inside of us? Well, the answer doesn't come from around us. It actually does come from inside of us. 
And if we're going to deal with the, the pride, then we need to look inside first, which is why, again, I think that the, the, the illustration of our sermon series is so good. It's about our hearts. If our relationships are going to re, be rehabbed, it starts inside of, of us. And so notice the second part of Proverbs 13.10 then. If we go back to the passage we were originally looking at, go back to, the, to uh, that particular verse, and what does it say? Uh, where there is strife, there is pride, point well made, especially through James chapter 4. But wisdom, wisdom is insight. It's the ability to see things as God sees them. Wisdom is found in those who take advice. You may wonder, what does advice or taking advice have to do with pride, and what does that have to do with conflict? And so often, and I'll illustrate it simply through the the, the posture of, of even our bodies as we deal with conflict and our receptivity to those around us and what they have to say. Our posture says a whole lot. Um, when you're in conflict with someone and they stand like this, some of you, Jacelyn, you just, okay, she doesn't, she's, okay, no, that's just your normal posture. That's okay, that's okay. You got scared, you got scared. When we default to a posture with arms folded, what does that communicate? Oh, Jonathan, now you're doing it. Oh, my God. Now all the arm folders. I know, I know, I know. I'm just kidding. Um, what does arms folded communicate as a nonverbal? Closed off. Yeah, closed off, right? That was my uh, biblical counseling class. It was like when you, when you counsel people, uh, no matter what you hear, you must sit there with arms, arms at your sides. Do not close off when someone is sharing their heart. Um, and so it is true, right? Like our posture with our arms communicates. How about if I were to walk around like this? Nose up in the air, what does that communicate? Yeah, you're stuck up, right? Yeah, you're, you're, you're kind of looking down on the, the people around you. How about when someone's communicating and you just keep your head down the whole time? Is that a closed off kind of posture? Yeah. And so where's wisdom found? Wisdom is not necessarily found with the posture of the heart with arms crossed. Wisdom is not found with the posture of the heart with the nose in the air. Wisdom is not found with the posture of the heart that, whose head is down. Wisdom is found in those who take advice. Wisdom is found in those who are open to what they might hear that they don't want to hear. And it's amazing what we start to learn about ourselves when we open ourselves up to those trusted voices around us. Now, I'll say it and I'll say it again. That does not mean that you self uh, name yourself as the trusted voice in someone's life and you just now you feel like you can go around and you tell everybody. That, that actually says more about you than it does the other people. Um, but what this means is that you and I are open to the wisdom that comes from people around us. But it's amazing how closed off we can be to that wisdom that comes in unlikely places. There are people who think that they can't learn anything from people who are older than they are. There are people who think that they have nothing to learn from people who are younger than they are. You have people who think they have nothing to learn from people who are not in the same place in life as they are. You have people who think that they have nothing to learn from people who are not as affluent as they are or who are less affluent as they, or who are more affluent than they are. You have people who think they have nothing to learn from and fill in the blank with whatever kind of person who is hard for you to take advice from or to hear from. Wisdom is found in those who take advice. And this is not just your garden variety advice. This is advice that's rooted and anchored in the wisdom of God's word. God speaks through a variety of, of, of means to communicate that word. And one of the things, the lessons that was hard for me to learn has been to be able to hear things that I, I don't want to hear necessarily. And one of the best things that I ever did was open myself up to the wisdom of a paid, professional, biblical counselor. It takes a lot of humility to stand in front of somebody and say, I sought biblical counseling to deal with some of my deep-seated personal issues. And as my friend Christine likes to say, every adult should be mandated 10 sessions with a biblical counselor. If only we would allow people to start to speak in. 
I said a few weeks ago that every follower of Jesus needs a, an Apostle Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy. Why? Because we need people around us who can give us that godly wisdom. We need the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament was sort of like the, the, the patriarch of, of the faith, if you will. He was the one further down the road. When we don't seek someone who's further down the road, it's, that's dangerous. This is why I have mentors who, who pour into my life and who, who help to equip me with God's wisdom to be able to lead well. It doesn't matter how long you've been following Jesus, you need to find someone who's further down the road. Because if you just have Barnabas and you just have Timothy, it's a surefire way to keep your pride filled exactly where it needs to be. But we need those trusted voices that are with us, the Barnabas, the people that we're walking shoulder to shoulder with, kind of living life together, so we know that we're not alone. We need those peers, we need those allies that we can link arms with. But we also need those Timothys to come after us because we realize that there are people following after us who need to see that humility in action, who need to see that wisdom in action. And so I think that the wisdom of this proverb, the point here is, is, is well made. We need to seek that godly counsel. Listen to advice and accept instruction. And in the end, you will be wise. But pride doesn't see it that way. Pride just doesn't listen. So what do we do? With pride. We talked about how destructive it is, how, how it brings dishonor, how it's at the source of a lot of our disagreements, if not all of our disagreements. We talked about how pride doesn't listen. I'm wondering if over the course of this sermon, you've thought of some people that you wish could have heard that sermon, or you thought, I hope that so-and-so is listening to that sermon today. Or maybe even I wish he would take his own medicine, even as he says that. We all have a pride problem. And it comes down to some of the ugliest ways. But a few years ago, I stumbled upon these questions that helped to get to the root of our pride problems. See if any of these apply to you. I, I know that, that I've felt convicted as I've uh, gone through them again and again and again. Number one, do you look down on those who are less educated, less affluent, less refined, or less successful than yourself? Number two, do you think of yourself as more spiritual than those around you? More spiritual, perhaps, than your mate, your closest friends, or others in your faith family? Three, do you frequently correct or criticize those around you out loud and in the quietness of your own heart? And then another one, do you frequently correct or criticize uh, those who are in authority over you? I think this is a subtle way that Christians get mixed up. Even just apply it politically for a minute. And how one half of us gets fired up four to eight years at a time. And then we get unfired up for another four or eight years. We get fired up, you know? So... Do you frequently correct or criticize those in positions of, of leadership or authority over you? It's a good one for me, too. The next one, do you have a hard time admitting when you're wrong? Six, do you have a hard time confessing your sin to God or those around you? Do you have a hard time when you're walking shoulder to shoulder with that friend, with that Barnabas, saying, hey, hey here's something I'm struggling with? And then seven, are you sitting here thinking of how many of these questions apply to someone you know? Feeling pretty good that none of these really apply to you. So what do we do about it? It was the, the preacher Martin Lloyd-Jones who said this, there is only one thing that I know of that crushes me to the ground and humiliates me to the dust, and that is to look at the Son of God and especially contemplate the cross. Nothing else can do it. When I see that I'm a sinner, that nothing but the Son of God on the cross can save me, I'm humbled to the dust, nothing but the cross can give me this spirit of humility. That it all comes back to Jesus again and again and again, that the answer to these Proverbs, the answer to pride, isn't moralism, it isn't try harder, it isn't learn more, it's about reflect Jesus better. 
comes back to the gospel. And the gospel doesn't just save us. It's the gospel, it's the good news of Jesus that sanctifies us. It's the gospel that, 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 that we, we don't walk away from at the moment of salvation as though we don't need it again, as though it's a flu shot and now we're inoculated for the rest of our lives. Although a flu shot is year to year, but you get the point. Every illustration breaks down at some point. Um, but the reality is the gospel that saves us is the gospel that continues to sustain us. And humility will never come in our own strength and our own power. It comes only in the power of Jesus. And we will become people whose lives are marked by humility, whose relationships are marked by humility, only as much as we submit ourselves to the one who shows us how it's done and the one who empowers us to do it. It's Jesus. And the longer we follow Jesus, the more humble we will become, not less. That this idea that the longer we follow Jesus and the more we learn about Jesus, the more prideful we are or the more arrogant we are, it is a lie straight from the pit of hell. And those of us who fool ourselves into thinking that we are superior, superior simply because we know more, know very little of the humility that comes from knowing Jesus and the humility that comes from demonstrating the change and changing life as he empowers us from the inside out. And that is a message that some of us need to hear this morning. that our closeness to Jesus is not based on how much we know. It's on our ability to love God, love others, love the world around us. That is how our spiritual maturity is measured. We need humility. Humility from Jesus that puts others first. Humility for Jesus that enables us to listen more and talk less. Humility that enables us to put our wants and wishes aside. Humility that pushes us to serve those around us. A humility that pushes us to overlook offenses. A humility that enables us to be patient in other people's sanctification process that is the process of becoming more and more like Jesus. We need, need humility, humility in every single relationship. And a lot of times I like to describe the, the relationships that we have in this life in the form of a triangle. And those of you who've been with us for any length of time know that we've talked about this, that we have this up component to our relationships. It's our relationship with God. We need humility in our relationship with God. We need to see ourselves as we are, that, that there is one who has all the answers. There is one who has all the wisdom. And it is not me and it is not you, right? It is, it is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We need to have humility before God. This is why our times of worship are so important because we're declaring to God what's going on in our hearts. We're communicating uh, with one another among ourselves who we believe God is, how we've experienced him. We need a healthy relationship with God, but we also need that, that those in relationships, those relationships within the family of faith, we need those to be healthy and to be strong. This is why we need humility to, to, uh, to bear with one another. Humility to, to overlook those offenses. Humility to, to, uh, to minimize our desires. Humility to walk alongside those who are hurting, to weep with those who weep, to rejoice with those who rejoice. But we also need humility in that other part of the triangle, and that is our out, our relationship with the world around us. We are mindful that, that, that we, we live our lives as Christians in light of the, the great commandment, right? To love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the up. The, 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 the second greatest, as Jesus said, to love our neighbor as ourselves, that's the in. But the great commission, right? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. It's the great commission. We're called on this mission to make the glory of Jesus known through our lives. And we need a humility as, follow, as followers of Jesus that's able to br build bridges to a world that desperately needs to experience the good news that we ourselves have experienced. And the longer we follow Jesus, the more and more we develop a heart for people who are still yet far from Jesus. This humility affects every relationship of ours. But the source, again, is Jesus. The gospel is the only thing powerful enough to strip away our pride. And so how do we squash our pride and how do we pursue humility? What if you and I just took four steps this week? And you can pick one of four steps. What if this week we simply examined our motives? There's a reason why you and I do what we do. And what if we started asking the question, where am I most tempted to show an attitude of pride? What if we started to seek God on that? What if we, we humbled ourselves before God? Or even sought the advice of that trusted uh, friend to speak into that. 
What if we answered those questions like, why do I want to be seen? Why do I need to be right? Why do I need to be better than blank? Why do I need to be in control? Why do I need to be perceived in this way? Why do I uh, look down on uh, so-and-so? Why do I... And what if we confessed those things and then pursued the humility that comes from Jesus? What if we also elevated other people around us? What if we identified ways we could elevate someone else by putting their needs and desires ahead of ours? One of the reasons why it's so easy uh, to elevate ourselves is because we have a hard time elevating others. The Apostle Paul tells us to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. But so often, even as Christians, we get that wrong. That when people are rejoicing, we're busy asking the question, well, why not me? And when, when people are, are weeping, we're just glad it wasn't us. And that's the ugliness of our own pride issues at work. It's easy to feel good about ourselves when we're able to look down on the people around us. What if this week we chose to spend time with someone who was hard for us to love or someone that we're tempted to view as less than us? Maybe even to spend some time with someone that we aren't in full agreement with. What if we spent some time this week encouraging people? What if we did that every day this week? We're far more likely to criticize and congratulate and complain rather than be grateful. But if we would learn to see people through the lenses of Jesus, there would be increasing humility. What if we learned to serve people? What if you chose someone who's hard to love and did something good for them? Or someone who is normally one you would look down upon? It's amazing how much humility can be birthed just through simple steps of faith. But I trust that God has spoken to you because every time we open God's word, he speaks he speaks to those of us who have ears to listen. And these truths, as ancient as they are, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old, they speak to the issues that humans have faced since the Garden of Eden. Your issues and my issues. What do you hear God saying to you today about your pride issues? And I'm hearing God speak about mine. And what will we do with it? Pray with me. Lord, we have come to experience that, that the gospel really is good news. That, that Jesus has come to this earth, sent to this earth. He's been sent to do for us what we could never do on our own. Lord, I'm reminded of the words of, of Tim Keller that um, we're more sinful than we can imagine and yet more loved than we can imagine. It's your, your son who demonstrates the full extent of your love for us. Lord, we confess today that we are not always as humble as Jesus died and lives to make us. We're not always loving. We're not always gracious. There are times, Lord, when we default to our desires and our passions. There are times when, when we allow those desires and passions not just to govern our own hearts, but we allow them to affect in negative ways our relationships. So Lord, today open our eyes to the good news of your son, to the one who doesn't just give humility, but the one who is humility. Lord, help us to do as the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 2 to have, have that attitude that Jesus had or has. One who, who made himself nothing and took on the very nature of a servant or slave. Lord, chip away at our pride, birth in us a sense of humility. In moments of weakness, in moments of failure, drive us again and again to the cross. Drive us again and again to that source of humility and that source of all that is good and all that is whole and all that is healthy, Jesus, the one in whose name we pray, amen.